Father, we come in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so very grateful and thankful for who you are and all that you've done in our lives, that you have blessed us so abundantly. We just love the time that you've given us to, the opportunity to feast upon your word, to understand it as, as you would have us understand it, knowing that our, our processes of our understanding are, are limited, we know and we believe, Lord, that you guide us into all truth. I ask that you would filter out all that foolishness, but just seal to our hearts truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've just uh, begun a study of the first epistle of John, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we looked at the, the first several verses. And I suggested that the phrase from the, the, from the beginning is, is likely looking at the Incarnation. Uh, we heard Him, uh, we saw Him, and then we considered Him carefully, and we found Him to be the Word of Life. And there's a great testimony in that verse, that Christ incarnate was in fact God of very God, and I suggested that our testimony is no different. Before we delve deeper here into uh, the epistle of 1 John, I want to just kind of take a little time out here. I want to pause long enough to uh, highlight, if I can, the scriptural doctrine concerning the finished work of Christ. You know, I, I would hate to think that, you know, I never presented a combination of verses on that, uh, on that particular subject in the period of my ministry here I know I've done several videos along the lines of that subject but I've never really uh, compiled a list of verses for you to look at now over the years I I've interacted with many people and I've uh, I've asked them to tell me why that they go to church Yet I have heard very few tell me that they go to church to learn more about Jesus Christ and what he's done for them. I mean, they go to church to enjoy the fellowship. They go to church for fun. They go to church because the music is great. They go to church to find a spouse. You know, and church is a, is a great place to look for a spouse. Others, they go to church because it's, it's on their conscience and, and they feel that they ought to go to church at least once a week. And folks, those are ridiculous reasons to go to church. I can't imagine anything, any entertainment uh, or anything else in church that would hold a candle to studying seriously this book. What I hear and what I read and... Uh, and what I see is the modern church has little to do with the serious study of the Word of God. So I've made a list of verses that I believe shed light on this subject, and I want to go over those verses. I hear very little today of what I would, I would call biblical truth, and, and that's a sad charge against the Christian church. I'm not saying that there aren't people out there who love the Lord who are concerned about the things of Christ. Of course there are. But when we have the word of the almighty eternal God in our hands, shouldn't we handle it as the word of God? And shouldn't we believe what God wants us to believe? As the church grew, it became very corrupt. It became so bad that people could, could, uh, they could buy indulgences to kill someone and, and there were people who seriously studied the scriptures and they said this isn't right and so we had what's known as the Reformation and many great Bible thinkers uh, came out of the Ref Reformation where is the Reformation today what have we done People have said to me that, that the word salvation means being born again. 
Okay, well, that's, that's, that's great. Okay, Timothy, take heed unto doctrine, for in so doing thou shalt born again yourself and them that hear you. Doesn't make any sense. Revelation 13, uh, now is our born again nearer than when we first believed. It, it, again, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't say that. Folks, what have we done with words? And what have we done with grammar? Uh, we don't do much with the Word of God. But in, in Psalms, we read, Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Well, do we magnify his word above all his name? Out of that Reformation, folks, came some strong arguments against the organized church. Scripture alone, Christ alone, faith alone, no other authority, not tradition, not the church, Scripture alone. Second Timothy 3.16 All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's what we read. Not one single writer in the Word of God wrote in his own intelligence, his own knowledge, his own understanding. He was carried along by God. That's why I always point that out at the beginning of each one of our studies. That we're not looking at Paul's logic. We're not looking at John's logic. But we're, we're reading the mind of God, the heart of God toward His people. We know because we can read that it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I want you to note the, the profitability that's emphasized there is doctrine. Okay? Truth. But people don't want doctrine. One year I received over a, a dozen invitations to speak, and the majority of them said, please don't bring up any doctrine. It's divisive. We, want, we, we just want a simple testimony, nothing more. And folks, the only testimony that I have is doctrine. It's all I know. It's the Word of God. 2 Corinthians 4.2, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Handling the Word of God deceitfully. And believe me, folks, that is absolutely rampant today. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's what I want to do. I don't want to handle this book deceitfully. You know, it was, it was the reformer who said, Christ is God, a very God. And, and folks, not many conservative seminaries really hold strongly to that position anymore. They used to, but, but not so much anymore. You know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is God, a very God, creator of heaven and earth, the sovereign majesty of, of eternity. That's the God we worship. There's no other God. There's none, none like Him. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which He purchased with His own blood. We know Christ did the purchasing. And that it's God who purchased the church with His own blood. There couldn't be a clear testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ. Here is a clear testimony that Jesus Christ is God. He's not part of God. He's not a God. He's not an offspring of God. He's God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. The Reformers, they loved, they loved the that, that tenet that of Christ alone, Christ alone. Man is totally 
depraved. I want you to imagine, folks, that everybody who broke from the organized church in the Reformation believed that man was totally depraved. And I don't hear that preached today. You owe your Protestantism to the fact that the Reformers believed man was totally depraved. All I hear are invitations to a totally depraved man to do something that he can't do. And uh, folks, I think that that's handling the, the Word of God deceitfully. The natural man and the spiritual man are two different entities. Biblically, one is, is born from beneath. One is born from above. I hope to be able to put all of these verses up here on the screen. I, I hope that, that you can take a screenshot of these verses. Many of you are familiar with them. Some of you may not be as, as much, but John 3, 6, chapter 3, verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The natural man cannot enter the kingdom of God. He can't do it. John 6, 4, 44, nobody can come to me except my Father forces him. The word is a strong word. It means to tie up and drag. John 6, 6, 6 uh, 63, it's the spirit that quickens the flesh profits nothing, yet modern Christianity pleads with the flesh to do something. It can't. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John 6, 65. Therefore I said unto you that no man has the ability to come unto me except it's given to him of the Father. Why don't you understand my speech? Because you can't hear my words. The natural man cannot hear the word of God. He can't hear it. But the one born from above can. John 10, 26, you don't believe because you're not my sheep. If you were my sheep, you would hear my voice. Now, folks, how could it be any stronger? You don't believe because you're not my sheep. Clearly, you have to be a sheep before you can believe. And clearly, modern evangelism says you got to believe to be a sheep. Now, now, one of them is wrong. You have to be one of God's sheep before you can believe. But that all went south. I believe man in his effort to exalt himself, exalt man and diminish God has, has made it a uh, man who decides whether or not he hears. And, you know, you, but you have to be born from above. John 14, 17, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Romans 8, 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. That's Romans 8, 7. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And modern evangelism says there's one exception to that verse. Okay, They can please God by accepting Christ. And I don't see that exception. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. There's no exception, folks, that, that says that this, this guy in the flesh, if he would accept Christ, that, that that would please God. Folks, that's not there. Okay, he can't do it. 1 Corinthians 2.14 the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Man is totally depraved. 
Therefore, we have life from above, which proceeds from Christ, not human choice. And that is, folks, that is crucial biblically, okay? Stop and think for a moment. Okay, stop and think. Nobody cho chose. Nobody chose their gender, their sex. You didn't choose to be a man or a woman. You didn't choose to be a girl or a boy. You didn't, you didn't choose your parents. You didn't choose your race. Now, you may be happy with your ethnic, ethnic uh, background, but, but you didn't choose it. You didn't choose your country. You didn't choose the, the time of, of your birth. You know, in fact, you could have been born back in the, in the Dark Ages. Could have been born during the time of Christ. You didn't choose your physical build or your physical appearance or your mental capability. And yet, though, there, there are those who say, even though you didn't have the ability to choose any of these things, well, you can, you can choose whether or not you go to heaven or hell. And, and that's, man, that is, that's fantastic. Here's a loving Heavenly Father that gave me very few choices, if any. But He surely didn't give me any important ones. You know, I'd have liked to, to, to have been out there with Daniel Boone, but I never had the chance. This same loving Heavenly Father says, Steve, you can decide whether you go to heaven or hell. Folks, who came up with that logic? John 1.12, as many as received Him, He gave power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on His name. That's where everybody stops. Okay? No... You know, no sense finishing the sentence. Who cares about sentences? Who cares about grammar? You know, many of you know I, I live in nowhere, Oklahoma. You know, where Romans uh, 3.23 is a popular verse. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's not even a sentence. It's just a phrase. Keep reading. Being justified freely by His grace through the, rege the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. People who call themselves evangelical who don't know that we are being justified freely by His grace. Dearly beloved, that verse ought to warm your hearts, every one of your hearts. Okay? You ought to find so much comfort in that verse. Everybody stops in John 1.12. Who were born not of blood, nor from any ethnic base, not because they're Jew or Gentile or anything else, nor were they born of the will of the flesh. Yet modern evangelism preaches that you are born again by the will of the flesh, by the will of man. Okay? When the verse says we were not, okay, it says we were born again by the will of God. They were born from above by God. They're God's children. They were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's what the text says. That's, what not, that's not what modern Christianity is telling you. They're not handling this book correctly. They're handling it deceitfully. We were God's children before, before God ever created the heavens and the earth. You were God's child before God created the heavens and the earth. Before Adam sinned. You were God's child. And we have leading seminaries preaching that some of God's children are going to hell. What a father that is. You know, folks, I think that's blasphemy. That the almighty, eternal God, the God of, of, of love, and the God of grace would allow some of His children to go to hell because they were naughty. I mean, you've you got to be kidding me. You can't do that, folks, with this book. They were born anew by God. John 3.3, 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, that is truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man has been born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh. Folks, if you plant wheat, you get wheat. You plant tear, you get tear. You plant, you plant a pear, you get a pear. Okay? Don't lie to me and tell me that you was a goat, but, th but then you accepted Christ and you became a sheep. That is not the truth. Okay? That which was born of the Spirit. Perfect passive. The perfect says it was done in past time. The passive voice says you didn't have anything to do with it. 
the wind, the spirit blows where it lifts. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you don't know from where it comes and where it goes. So is everyone having been born of the spirit. There, there's a time, folks, where you may, that, that you might look back and you might think of, well, this was my conversion experience, you know, like Paul on the, on the road to Damascus. But folks, was that, is that when Paul was headed for heaven? Absolutely not. He was separated from his mother's womb. He was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. There never was a time in the life of Paul that he would not have, have, have gone to heaven. Okay, He was always God's child. And it's a gross mishandling of Scripture to suggest that Paul made some personal decision in his life and changed his life so that now he's going to heaven instead of going to hell. Yet that's what modern Christianity believes. Folks, how could things have become so turned around backwards, upside down? Dearly beloved, hell is what you deserve, but you'll never see it. You'll never see it because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. I don't know how many times that I've heard John 5, 24 quoted to me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What is Christ saying in that verse? Everyone that hears my word and believes on God who sent me has everlasting life and shall not con come into condemnation. They passed from death unto life. You know, it, it's a great evangelistic verse, you know, because, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. If you hear, if you hear and if you believe, then you won't come into condemnation. But folks, it doesn't say that. Hath passed is a perfect participle that precedes the action of the main verb. Before you ever heard, before you ever believed, you had already passed from death unto life. You already had been born from above by the Spirit of God. John 10, 16. Other sheep I have, I already have. They're not of this fold. Them I also must bring. Not the flesh must bring. Not man must bring. I must bring. And folks, I'm just reading Scripture our Lord said, you believe not because you're not my sheep. Romans 5.1 Romans 5.1 be, Being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not your personal trust in Christ, but the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. 5.19 for Romans 5.19 For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam's, Many were made sinners. So by the obedience of the one, that is Jesus Christ, shall many be made righteous. No wonder the reformers taught spiritual life preceded faith in Christ. What is so hard to understand about something has to be quickened to life first before it can, there can be any response on the part of that, of that individual? What is not taught today is that very simple, basic, biblical truth. Reconciliation precedes salvation. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Saved by his life. A thousand times I've been told over the years that I'm saved by the death of Christ. Saved by the death of Christ. That's, I've heard that my whole life. Even that's not true. We've got to be careful with words, folks. We're not saved by his life or his death. We're not saved by his death. We're saved by his life is what the text says. When did we stop caring about words? You know, and, and they'll quote that. And when I ask for a verse of scripture, you know, they'll look at me like I'm an idiot. You know, I, I say, I just want one verse. Just show me one verse. And they just, and they just insist that we're saved by the death of Christ. That's what, that's what they've heard their whole lives. And that's what, that's what I've heard my whole life and we're just saved by the death of Christ okay that's preached every day folks but the verse doesn't exist 
And I don't want to preach something that's not there. I am saved by his life. I'm reconciled. I'm justified by his death, a substitutionary death. But I am saved by his life. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, conform to the image of his Son. The words to be aren't there in the original text. You know, how, how foolish for Christians to say, well, he looked down the, God looked down the annals of history and he knew what I'd do. You know, it's, it, so he chose me based upon my decision. So really, election really, really doesn't, and I mentioned this a while back, you know, you, you just don't even talk about election if you're going to come in behind it with the idea that, that God chose you because you chose him. Well, now you've just destroyed the whole nature of election why even why 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 would there be any election why would god mention election in the in the to begin with in the first place if it was if if what was true was that god's decision choice of you was based upon your choice of him when 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 it's i mean it shouldn't be hard for anyone to understand that we've robbed God of that glory. We've taken that out of the realm of the spiritual. We put it into the realm of the flesh. Romans 8, 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, conform to the image of his Son. That's what the text says. For those he knew intimately, beforehand he predestinated already conformed to the image of his son if you've got the authorized version in the word the words to be okay uh they're not there he predestined you conformed to the image of his son because you were made righteous by the obedience of christ now where's any synergism there where's your acceptance where are all the cliches that I hear in modern evangelism? They're not there. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ alone. Life before belief. And who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God who made righteous. If you say I'm not righteous, well, you talk to God about it. He says I am. That's what the verse is saying. Who is he that condemns? How can you condemn me? Christ died in my place and rose again, which testifies to the fact that his death was sufficient and he's now at the right hand of God making intercession for us. Romans 9.11 for, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad so that God's purpose according to his choice would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. And that's a most hated verse by most of modern evangelists. Because it goes against their narrative. And Jesus told his disciples that the world would hate him because he chose them. He chose them. Because his... Why? Because his choice of us is raised against the common notion, the common thought being, well, that isn't fair. Look at what, look at what all I have done. And then these guys, God chose them and he didn't, but look at me, I'm so different than them. I've... Folks, don't you get that? And those, these guys smelled of fish. You know what? I'd rather smell like fish. You know, it's a marvelous, wonderful possession to know that Jesus Christ chose me, that he died in my place, that he, he's delivered me from sin, he's delivered me from the penalty of sin, delivered me from the power of sin, that I stand before him holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. Colossians 1.22, crucified with Christ. Galatians 2.20, uh, that Galatians 2 19 20 21 I believe I live yet not I but Christ lives within me in the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the faithfulness of the son of God says the original text 
not in, of, because God's faithful, not, not by my faith in him, says most modern translations, but by his faithfulness, says the original text. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect by the flesh? Galatians 4.16. One verse alone. That verse or any, any one of these verses is enough. It's, it's, why do we need so many verses? I don't know, because maybe because the idea of human merit is so ingrained within us. How is it that so many find it so offensive, the fact that, that we were promised to Christ before we were ever born? Because we're living in an age of apostasy? Of falling away from the faith? You know, modern Christianity, I believe that, I'm, I be, I'm convinced modern Christianity believes that this apostasy is something that lies ahead of us at some point in the future when the, when the fact of the matter, folks, is that that definition of apostasy, the very definition, when, when by definition, modern evangelism, modern Christianity, that system that's based on human merit, is that apostasy. James 1.18 Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we, should, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. 1 Peter 1.2 Elect according to the knowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Uh, oh my you know you sit around and you wonder isn't anyone reading their bible today aren't any of these pastors of these churches spending time in study today what has happened what has happened folks since the reformation 400 plus in a few years what was it 15 17 to 15 20 15 21 400 years the word says we're born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which lives and abides forever now why wouldn't he have said by means of our faith in Christ. Well, because that's not true. We're not born from above because we trusted Him, accepted Him, received Him, or because we made Him our, our personal Savior. Okay? Or we made Him Lord of our life. Folks, He's Lord of your life whether you make Him that or not. We're born from above by the Spirit of God, and by the Word of God. Okay? The Word of Truth. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, perfect passive, okay, has already been born by God from above. All of that Scripture, I, I gave you the references. You can wrangle over all these verses and you can make them mean anything that you want, folks. You can make them any, mean anything you want them to mean. I'm going to take God at His word. Unlike, you know, this guy, and, I, and I'm not into mentioning names. Not, unlike this guy, and that guy, and this other guy, and, you know, and, and all, these, all the, these bunch of other guys at some seminary teaching that God justifies us if we only do something. How can, anybody, how, how can anybody believe that that has studied this book? And folks, Christians today place a lot of trust in the one that they put over them to lead them and, and instruct them in the Word. And it breaks my heart that so many are just outright being misled 
led away from the truth instead of toward it. It's just rampant today. It's the number one primary cause for my interest in this ministry. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, perfect passive, has already been born by God from, from above. How can anybody in the light of the scriptures that we've looked at say, say anything like that? But that's what's coming out of our leading seminaries today. I'm talking about conservative seminaries. I've, I've had a personal run-in with, with some of these individuals, prominent uh, leaders of the Christian community of, of our generation, a personal, you know, run-in with these some of these individuals since going well, going back as far as the 80s, the late 80s, 1980s. And I love them dearly. I do. I truly do. And I love them. I appreciate them for all the, the for the tremendous contribution that they made in the work of Christ. But folks, we cannot handle this book deceitfully. And as we begin to go through this wonderful epistle, first epistle of of, of John, first John. I hope that, that you will will see how this that the importance of this really comes into into play here. Uh, you're redeemed because he died in your place, and you're saved, you're delivered because you trust Christ. Those are totally different subjects. You you are reconciled by his blood, you're made righteous by his death in your place, you are saved or delivered in this life if you believe that. If you don't believe that, you're still going to heaven. I challenge anybody to tell me that you go to heaven by something that you do. You are God's child because you are always God's child. He loves you with an undying love. I pray for you all constantly, and I, I want to take just a second to thank you once again for all the comments of encouragement that you leave me. Those mean a lot. All of your prayers. Uh, I just... I think it's obvious by now that, that there's, a, there's a good reason why I didn't... Uh, well, I'll just tell you, there's a good reason why I didn't really put myself out there this this September, this Feast of Trumpets, as far as a rapture update goes. It's because I just, folks, I just flat out don't believe it's going to be in the fall, okay? And I don't believe it's going to have much to do with Israel at all. So I'm looking forward to spring as we go into spring. And that's not to say that he can't come today or tomorrow or any day. Once again, thank you all for everything. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.